Romans chapter 6. We're going to be looking today at verses 1 through 4. Originally, I was going to take you to verse 14, but you'll see in a moment why we're not going that, to that uh, verse because there's so much in verses 1 through 4 that I want to give to you to lay a foundation for the verses that uh, come after that. And you'll see this in just a moment. So let's begin reading in Romans in chapter 6. We'll begin at verse 1. I'll read to verse 4 and we'll get into our study. Romans chapter 6 beginning at verse 1. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so chapter 6 actually begins with a question. Notice with me, uh, it's a question that, that is a natural continuation of what he had just written in chapter 5. Because in chapter 5, he had said in verse 20, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So the question obviously would be, what does he mean by this? What did he mean when he said that sin abounded? Well, one, we need to know or remember that the Bible, God's Word, reveals to us there's something called sin. It's missing the mark. And God reveals to us that it's not something that's simply incidental. It actually has a depth to it. So God reveals to us the depth of sin. He also speaks concerning um, its penalty. And uh, He actually identifies for us activities that He calls sinful. And so... Sin is something that is revealed in Scripture, and the Bible says there's a penalty to it, and the penalty, according to Ezekiel 18.20, well, it is the soul whose sin shall die. The wages of sin, Paul tells us, is death. It's appointed unto men to die but once after this judgment. And so Isaiah 3.11 says, Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. So, Sin exists. It isn't just mental error or lapses of judgment, not simple mistakes. It's called sin in the Bible. And the Bible refers to it and also speaks concerning the reality as well as its penalty. But though the Word reveals the reality of man's sin and its punishment, it also points to the grace of God. The Word of God reveals to us that no matter how deeply a person has sinned, that person still has the potential to be redeemed. Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. He forgives all your iniquities. God is capable through the blood of Christ to forgive us of all sin. In Isaiah 43, 25, it reads, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. And so grace is the backdrop that reveals the beauty of, of God to the sinner. But, as in the day of Paul, there is still a misunderstanding of what this grace is. Grace is a Greek word in the New Testament, and uh, it's the word charis. And charis basically means undeserved favor from God. And Christianity is completely built and permeated by the grace of God. It's built on the grace of God and permeated by the grace of God. And when you read your scriptures, you'll see this where grace is mentioned in a variety of ways. The Bible teaches, for example, that we're saved through the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. The Bible teaches we are spiritually gifted by the grace of God. Romans 12, 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. We are set apart for ministry by the grace of God. Galatians 1.15, Paul says, It pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. We stand positionally justified in the Lord Jesus Christ by God's grace. In Romans 5.2, we saw that Paul said, Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and then... We are to live separated lives by the grace of God. 2 Corinthians 1.12 says, This is our boast, our conscience testifying, 
that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relation with you in the holiness and sincerity that are from God. We have done so not according to worldly wisdom, but according to God's grace. So we're saved by the grace of God, spiritually gifted by God's grace, set apart for ministry by God's grace. We stand positionally justified in Jesus Christ by grace, and we are separated by God's grace. So somebody asked the question, since we're enabled to do all these things by grace, are we also enabled to sin by grace? Does God give us permission to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Well, some argued then and now that grace may be understood as permission to continue in sin. And that's why verse 1 opens with a question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Okay, we're saved. We have a free ticket to heaven. Everything's okay now. God's grace, unmerited favor, undeserved favor has now in, in, enveloped us as air is to a bird and, and the water is to a fish, so grace is to the believer. And seeing that we are immersed in grace, we live in grace, we stand in grace, we serve in grace, we're gifted by grace, and all of these things, does that mean I can continue in sin? And, and if I sin even greatly, doesn't that magnify the grace of God because the worse I am, doesn't that deepen the reality of God's grace as He saves me? Well, that would have been the natural response when he asked this question to what had been written regarding justification. Because he had said in chapter 5, verse 19, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And so the people would be arguing, oh, wait a minute, disobedience demonstrates God's grace because he saves you even though you're extremely disobedient, so doesn't that amplify the grace of God? And so that's what gave rise to the perception that sin is permitted. Now, this kind of mentality existed during the time of the writing of Paul, obviously, because he's dealing with it here in Romans chapter 6. But this kind of mentality is not limited to unbelievers. It's an attitude that many professing believers have even to this day. And, and there are those who've referred to that kind of mentality as, as cheap grace. Some of you have heard that term before, cheap grace. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Cheap grace. We cheapen the grace of God when we give it give a, a definition that al allows me as a professing Christian to continue in sin. And that's why Paul in verse 2 gives his answer when he says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Listen, if we've been saved, we are not to be walking in sin. That's, a Paul, that's what Paul's saying. That's what he's making. That's his point. Shall we abuse God's grace and continue to sin to our heart's content? His answer would be, of course not. Now, some confessing believers have taken advantage of the grace of God they live in what has been referred to as a fool's paradise. They believe that they're saved, but they live in sin continually and habitually. They're involved in sexual immorality. They're addicted to internet porn. They're, they're greedy. They're always angry. They're still doing drugs and drinking. They're still fighting and lying and cheating. And all the while, they're claiming that they know the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us have been like that on occasion. Some of us have friends who claim to be believers who are like that right now, have no sense of walking with God, have no desire for His Word, have no Christian fellowship of any sort. And yet if you ask them, are you a Christian, are you a believer, they'll say, oh yes, I went forward at Calvary Chapel and I got saved, but they're still living in sin. And they're deceiving themselves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11, through 11, Paul said this, he said, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. 
you were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of our God. So Paul has already rejected this notion, recognizing that some could not grasp the idea of grace. You see, there, are, there were those who thought that grace was not capable of producing motivation for holiness. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to regulate all of your behavior. If you do this, you're good. If you don't do this, you're bad. So they want to give you rules and regulations to motivate your behavior. Grace is deeper than that. When you come to a knowledge of the grace of God, it humbles you. It awakens you to your own sinfulness and His greatness. It causes you to say, God, you've been merciful to me. And with that mentality, you make a decision that you want to serve the Lord for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean that you become instantly perfect. It doesn't mean that you become as righteous as God would have you to be eventually. It simply means that you've turned the direction of your life. And you begin to forsake those things that at one time had held you in bondage. And you're now walking as one who's made free by the Lord Jesus Christ. You say they misunderstood grace. And what they were doing is they were, they were arguing that Paul was preaching what we call license. That's why in chapter 3, verse 8, he had already addressed this. But that's why he said, why not say, let us do evil that good may come as we are slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say. So they've been arguing that Paul says, oh, you can do anything you want because now you're walking in grace. And so the legalists would be saying, well, you're giving them permission to abuse God and to not live a holy life. But the fact is grace is the motivator for us to live for Christ. It's the motivator that causes us to turn from sin and to live for Him. That's why he asks the question, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now when he speaks of dying to sin, he's speaking concerning being dead to the dominance of sin in our lives. And we are dead to the dominance of sin in, in, in our lives because we've been made alive by Jesus Christ. Now we, we're still prone to sin. But by exercising faith, we can have victory through Jesus Christ. We know that he died in our place. And we also know that we are recognized as being dead with him. It's like what he said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live by faith, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith by the Son of God, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I live by faith in Christ because he gave himself for me but I recognize myself as being crucified in Christ. Yet I'm still alive. I recognize the reality of the fact that when I gave my heart to Christ, when I was converted, when I was born again, I recognize that when Jesus died on the cross, he was dying for me. And when I recognize that he died on my behalf, not because of sins he committed, but in order to atone for the sins that I have committed, in order to pay the price that I should have been paying for myself, when Jesus died in that way for me, and I acknowledged that by faith and confessed my need for Christ and asked for forgiveness, that was not to continue in sin, but that was in order that I might be set free from the bondage that I was already living in. And then God, by His Holy Spirit, uh, takes residence in the believer. And when He takes residence within us, we, uh, we are now made alive by the Spirit of God, and we have His power. And now we can live victoriously. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. And so we're dead to the dominance of sin and also to the judicial guilt which brought judgment because we've been, made by, uh, we've been saved by grace and have been made righteous through Jesus Christ. Now this doesn't mean that we'll never sin again because... None of us is sinlessly perfect outside of me. The rest of you are just terrible sinners. Obviously, we're all sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not a single one of us in this room outside of Jesus' spirit who is sinless. In 1 John 1, 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. So we have victory in Christ, and we can have victory over sin's domination. Grace gives us freedom from sin, but it does not give us freedom to sin. You see, some have misinterpreted grace to mean permission to sin and still be righteous. 
That's something that the early church had to deal with. When you read the book of Jude, for example, in verse 4, Jude said, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago. They have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So he says they worm their way into your churches, and they say God's grace allows us to live immorally. No, by God's grace, we're empowered to live lives that glorify God and to be victorious over sin. We're able to overcome our desire to practice sin because we've been born again. The Bible makes it very clear that He has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Holy Spirit lives within me. I'm the temple of the Spirit of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And yet there are people who run around saying, well, I just can't help myself. It's part of my nature. I don't have self-control. Even though Galatians 5 tells us the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, we say, I don't have self-control. I'm incapable uh, of actually controlling myself. That's, what, myself. That's why I continue to drink. That's why I continue to be violent. It's because it's just part of my nature, and I, and I can't help myself. It's the individual who says that they cannot help but sleep around. They don't have the control of themselves to be able to, to keep from doing that. It's the guy who goes to a bar dance or wherever you want to go, a club. And he's there to find somebody and he picks her up. And as he's with this girl, she becomes obviously open and willing to accompany him back to his apartment or his house or wherever. And she goes with him. And he takes her there with this mentality that he's going to have uh, sexual intercourse. He goes with that mentality. Now he's a believer. You know, he'll be in church on Sunday, but this is after all, it's Saturday. It's a different day. So there he is at the club, and he's, he's doing his best to be able to, to get into bed with this girl. And, and when you talk to him and you say to him, this isn't right, bro. You, you know it's wrong. The Bible teaches us that fornication is a sin. He says, well, you know what? I'm a man and God's grace, and I don't have self-control, and, and, and he understands and he loves me anyway. And I can't stop myself when she, once I begin, I'm, not, I'm, I'm unable to control myself. I have no control over this. So he's with the girl. So the question has to be asked. What if he's about to involve himself sexually with this girl and the girl says to him, you need to know that I have HIV and I'm infectious. And if we continue and actually have intercourse, you will be infected. Do you think the guy will say, oh, that's cool, no problem, I'm in the grace of God? <laughs> I don't think so, do you? I don't think so. Do you think suddenly he's going to have self-control? I think so. I suspect. But here's the problem, guys. Here's the problem. The fear of AIDS in him is greater than the fear of God. He's more afraid of AIDS than he is of God. Because he knew all along God's word said you cannot fornicate. God's word makes it clear. You cannot fornicate. The one who does will, will perish. No, I'm in grace. No, wait a minute. Apply that grace to fornicating with that woman with AIDS. Oh, no, I now exercise self-control. How's that work? Because you are more afraid of a venereal disease or HIV than you are of God himself. What's that tell you? It tells me, at least as a pastor, it tells me that you really don't understand grace. You don't understand God. You don't. And that's why Paul would say, do not fool yourself. If you continue in sin, it's because you haven't been redeemed. If you continue in sin, it's because that's your natural lifestyle. If you can sin without any sense of remorse or any sense of pain over it, then it's obvious you have not connected the, to the one who died on the cross for you. There are quite a number of people, and no, I'm not calling your salvation into question, but perhaps you need to think about this. There are a number of people who have deceived themselves into believing they're saved because they said a prayer or they went forward at a church service or a crusade. No changes have ever taken place in their life. They're not hungry for the Word of God. They're not hungry for fellowship with God's people. They're not hungry for, for prayer. They never share anything with anybody else concerning the things of God. That doesn't exist in their life. They simply took a 30-foot walk, and now 
they're thinking that they're going on to heaven when in reality they may be self-deceived because they've never really repented. Because if sin is their lifestyle choice, it's quite obvious they don't know the God who saves us from sin. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, it says it like this. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of of God. Now again, this doesn't mean that after being born again, we never sin again, but it does mean that we can have victory in Christ and over its domination. I can have victory through Jesus Christ, through faith in Him and by the power of His Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, Paul said it like this. He said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can be victorious but we need to exercise our faith and do that which is pleasing to him, called obedience. Now, as Paul is speaking, he wants to amplify this by using an illustration. So in verse 3, he asks a question, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We also should walk in newness of life. Paul is using water baptism to teach concerning a believer's union with Jesus Christ. Water baptism represents Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. When we're baptized, we are identified with those events. The word baptism, as it's translated in English, is the Greek word baptizo, and the word baptizo speaks of, of dying something. It speaks of uh, we'll say I have a uh, woolen cloth and it's, we'll say it's uh, white and I drop it into some dye and I pull it out. It has been baptized. It has been immersed. It has taken on the color of purple. And so immersion is the picture. Baptism is a picture of us being immersed in Christ. So we're taking on new nature. It's a picture of us taking a new nature. Now we don't get this new nature by being water baptized alone. We actually have this new nature through being born again and the Spirit of God dwelling within us. But it's a picture when you're water baptized of what Christ has done for you. So when we have baptisms here, and we'll have one in June at the end of the month on a, on a Sunday night, when we have baptisms here, I'll teach on baptism, and I speak concerning the fact that they're going to go into that water. They're going to go into the pool. And I'll say, you're going to step into the water. We're going to talk for a few minutes. I'm going to ask you your name. And then I'm going to say to you, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I said, and then you're going to go down. I'm going to release you because I'm not going to let you drown me. You're going to go down on your own. Now, some of you need to stay for a long time. <laughs> when you're half dead, I'll pull you out. When you go down, that's a picture of death and burial. When you come out of the water, that is a picture of resurrection, newness of life. It's an enacted parable. It's a drama with great beauty. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I have been buried in him, but I'm alive because of him. It's a beautiful picture. And that water, when you go down, is a picture of you entering into a grave. It's an open symbol of a person's faith in Jesus Christ. It, it dramatizes the fact that the old nature is crucified with Jesus, and now we are alive in him. There's a finality, by the way, that's associated in burial. Those of you who have gone to funerals know exactly what I'm saying. Many years ago, my grandmother, who was 92 years old at the time, my grandmother died at the age of 92. And uh, I went to my grandmother's funeral. And my dad and I were there standing next to my grandmother, my father's mother's casket. And as he and I were standing shoulder to shoulder and we were spending a last moment just viewing the remains of my grandmother, my father, 
who was very st stoic, a very strong man emotionally, didn't show his emotions very well and very easily. My dad was looking at his, his mama, and he turns to me, and he says, look at her hands. Now, my grandmother was four foot ten. She was very small. And her hands had been, been harmed by arthritis. So her hands were very, very twisted. And my dad drew my attention to my grandmother's hands. And he says, you see those hands? And I said, yes, Dad. And he said to me, they made a lot of tortillas in her lifetime. <laughs> and I said, I know, I remember it, because we would go to my grandmother's when we were little, and every Saturday she would make us fresh tortillas. She made them every day. My, mom ha my grandmother had this big old, um, I don't even know what you call it. It's like a hamper, but it wasn't. My grandfather had made her, and she had 50-pound bags of flour that she would dump in it, and she had 12 kids. And so she would make tortillas all the time, right? So my dad draws my attention to that. Made a lot of tortillas in her day, and I said, yes, I know, I remember. He said, she used them on my head more than once. <laughs> I said, I know, Daddy. And so we went and finished that part of the service and went to the grave site. Dad and I are standing next to the grave of his mother as they drop the uh, casket in. Dad hasn't said anything, hasn't really made any noise of any sort, hasn't spoken to me. He's just quietly watching as they drop the casket in. But when that skip loader came and pushed the dirt onto that casket, my dad suddenly let out a moan from the deepest part of his heart. Because it's over, Mama's dead. That's what burial is. It's over. When you, excuse the emotions, I'm thinking of that. I'm thinking of my dad and his pain. When you go into the water, you are dead and buried. It's over. That's what Paul wants us to know. It's over. Do not let the old life resurrect. Be alive in Christ. And that's why he's saying, do you not remember your own baptism? Do you not remember what it meant? Dead, buried, but alive in Christ. So if we are dead and buried in Jesus why would we want to live in sin any longer? Why would we continue and say we have permission to continue in sin? Do we not understand our own baptism? When you receive water baptism, you are dead and you are buried, but now you're alive. So live in newness of life. Live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the newness that God has given to us by His power. We don't have to go back to the old life. We don't have to return like a, a dog returns to its vomit or a pig returns to the, to the mire that it's been washed from. We, we don't have to do that. We have power in Christ to live victorious lives. We don't have to go back. My, my old nature is crucified with Jesus Christ. So baptism's a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. And because it's true, then it is not part of a Believer's life to continue in sin. In Galatians 5, 24 and 25, it says, Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we shall also be raised. And so we should walk in newness of life. When it speaks of Jesus being raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, the glory speaks of of, his, of the exercise and of his power through resurrection that produces glory. God raised Jesus from the dead and God imparts his life to us. We walk in resurrection power. Romans 8, 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Walk in newness of life. People are looking at you and me 
We're not paranoids. It's just true. You have claimed to be a Christian. What is a Christian? They're not going to read the Bible, but they will read you. They will read you on the job site. They will read you in the classroom. They will read you in family get-togethers. They watch you. You claim to be a Christian, so they're going to watch you. You're the living Bible to them. They want to see what a Christian really is all about. Sometimes they provoke you. Sometimes they want to argue with you. Sometimes they want to punish you. Sometimes they just are just, they speak evil of you. Sometimes they may even physically harm you. They want to see what you're made of. What are we made of? Well, Paul is saying, listen, if we've been renewed in Christ, let us not use grace as an excuse to continue in sin. Let us not act like the world and be as the world and think like the world. Let us live holy lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us follow him with all of our hearts. And yes, we're going to fail. Yes, I don't want to teach you to fail, but I accept the fact that I do fail. It's just a fact of life. I can't be as good as I want to be, not this side of heaven. But I don't want to use it as an excuse to continue in sin either. We need to humble ourselves. We need to seek God's forgiveness. We need to repent from our sin. We need to dust ourselves off and begin to walk with him again and move forward. But let us not use grace as an excuse to continue in sin. I know of some people who who party on Saturday and serve in children's ministry on Sunday. And that just doesn't make sense to me. We need to live for Jesus in these last and dark days, don't we? We need to live for him. People need to see that God is alive. And God is alive in us. May we live in such a way that we understand our own baptism, that we understand that I have died, yet I'm alive in him. When I went into that water, that was my burial. But I came out as a living, brand new individual in Jesus Christ. May we live as those who really understand that today. May we not cheapen God's grace, but may we just live in his grace and let him work in us and move in us to his own glory and his own praise.